Gates. My name is Allison Posey. I am just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I am thrilled to be with you all today to, uh, for one of CAST's free webinars. So today we get to talk with three state leaders on how Universal Design for Learning, UDL, has been supported across multiple districts in their states. They'll share how they leverage UDL to unite systems work and focus on equitable learning. We'll hear about their key levers for change and barriers they have encountered. And we recognize that many states and countries are active in this work. And that today we're just hearing from three folks, state leaders from Wisconsin, New Hampshire, and Delaware. I know you'll hear the variability in their stories and how each supports universal design for learning, but look also for those common threads because it is amazing to hear um, what's common among uh, these different states. So as we get going today, we do invite you all to contribute to the discussion through um, whether you're joining us live. So welcome for those of you who are joining live. Thank you for already introducing yourselves and letting us know where you're calling in from, where you're Zooming in from. And if you're watching our recording at a later date, we are welcoming you as well. Um, during the live webinar, you can use the text chat and please be sure to um, check all panelists and the attendees so that we can all benefit from your comments. Um, and if you're watching the recording, you can still contribute to the conversation through Twitter. So please feel free to share at cast underscore UDL, the hashtag States Unite for UDL, or the at DE Delaware Access Project. So there are a couple hashtags you could use to continue the conversation beyond the scope of just this webinar. You can also turn on the closed captions by clicking on the closed captions now available option. So thank you, Steph, for being, a, being with us today uh, with the captions. It's just fabulous to have you here. Uh, all of the resources that we talk about are available through our digital handout. So there's a bit.ly um, UDL state leaders link that you can, we will make available for you during and after this webinar. So you can access any of the resources that we talk about. Um, don't worry, <laughs> those, those will be up and available for you indefinitely. So look for the recording as well as this digital handout to be available for you. And as I mentioned, we have an amazing group with us today. Amy Brown, Megan Conway, Susan Vinema, Jane Bischoff, Mary Lane, Greg Amend. We are so thrilled to have you all here today. Thank you so much for joining. And instead of going through and introducing each person right now, um, you're going to get to chat with each one of them a little bit um, and get to know them more as they share about their stories. So hang tight. Uh, I just want to take one more moment before I introduce them to share our goals. So our goals are to discuss state level goals for UDL implementation and how UDL was initiated at a state level to share both the opportunities and the barriers around UDL UDL implementation from a state perspective and to share resources. And we hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation and that we'll be able to network and grow and continue the conversation with you all. So I'll pause here for a moment and see if you have any questions or any goals before we get started. Please let us know that by adding your ideas into the chat. And then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Jane Bischoff, uh, so great to see you here today. And we will kick off here with your story from Wisconsin. Welcome, Wonderful. Jane. Wonderful, just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect um, entrance. <laughs> not a good day to have technology problems, but no worries. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jane Bischoff. I am the UDL consultant for the state of Wisconsin. I'm very grateful to be with you today. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, everyone who's helped kind of put this panel discussion together. It's really important that um, Wisconsin um, continue to grow in our work with UDL, and this is another element that helps us learn from others across the country. And um, even getting to tell our own story, it helps us clarify a little bit more about what it is we're really thinking and doing. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, I, I want to tell you that much of the UDL work does intersect with a lot of different initiatives and innovations we have at the department. Um, as you might imagine, UDL kind of generalizes across much of um, 
the activity that we have when we're focusing on projects that are addressing learning, which are pretty much all of them. Um, you'll notice there's a little arch, or I call it maybe an umbrella too, under which or through which, um, you know, any innovation could really be elevated and benefit from the kind of thinking that um, happens when you're working with universal design for learning. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of that intersection with some other projects as we go ahead. But um, if you want to go to the next slide, Wisconsin has two systems of support that we are really trying to um, keep bolstered and have capacity in for supporting UDL implementation for the entire state. So we have a grant project through the discretionary grant um, IDEA funding that goes to nine different LEAs across the state, um, strategically chosen for representation of rural, urban, and suburban locations and include elementary, middle school, and high schools. And another system of support is the Cooperative Educational Service Agencies or our regional intermediate agencies um, across the state of which we have 12 and each CESA has a designated consultant to support UDL implementation in the region. The LEAs are um, designated as UDL um, demonstration sites. And what that means in Wisconsin is those particular districts have activities that we build and carve out as part of the funding allocation that help them grow in their quality of implementation of UDL and fidelity of that. And other districts who are interested in um, how they got started um, what were some things they learned? What were some barriers they addressed? How is it going? What kind of you know, training was really pivotal? Um, much of what we're gonna be talking about today for each of the states. Um, so these aren't necessarily considered model UDL implementation sites. These are, um, these are just critical friends, helpers of the state of Wisconsin while themselves benefiting um, in their organizations of having UDL in place. And finally, CAST is a part of supporting those two systems because without CAST, we certainly would not be where we are. Um, in addition to training and coaching support for UDL itself, CAST has really helped us grow and advance our thinking in the area of our beliefs about learning and um, our critical friends to help us think through some of the strategy we, we might wanna try or how to go about it. And so um, they're very welcoming to any educator from really any of our districts and the, um, really help support that capacity of our regional consultants as well. Um, readiness for UDL is not, um, always a pre-existing condition. Um, you know, readiness has to be really something that is addressed overtly and deliberately. And we, we've done that in Wisconsin. And CAS first introduced us to this iterative phase by phase implementation of UDL based on research. And about the same time when we were really taking the grant from just learning about what UDL is and trying some things out in a classroom, to really trying to work on the host environment and making that conducive to really supporting UDL implementation and what that means. Um, our, our cabinet, our um, leaders were saying, we would like some more across department combining of efforts. And so we were involved in being selected by the National Implementation Research Network with a center that they had for state implementation and scaling up of evidence-based practices or CISUP in five implementation active frameworks. And these five frameworks over on the right-hand side of the screen identify things to have in place so that an innovation actually is designed to happen. You don't just hope it happens or let it happen, but you actually design it to happen. So this became really a part of the UDL grant project design um, as we 
you know, created different activities for each of the year of the funding. So, of course, we have the teams from the schools, the districts, the regional CESA offices in the state. UDL is our it. This is the thing. And getting your hands around, you know, what is UDL? Well, you know, we're finding it hard. What isn't it, actually? Um, but we are intentional about some of those critical features that truly make UDL UDL. And um, that's it's really great to have really come full circle back to that. We intentionally um, understand that change happens in stages and that each stage, you know, you're, you're never really fully out of one because of the iterative process. We know that um, by research that there are implementation drivers that are essential for the innovation to actually maximize the benefit to learners. So we have drivers in the area of competency, drivers in the area of organization and leadership. And then finally, the PDSA cycles, plan, do, study, act, or mini improvement cycles or usability studies, however people may phrase them, CAST introduced us to them through the UDL implementation trials where there's some really deliberate work in collegial teams that share curriculum in learning design versus lesson planning, delivering that lesson, and then um, looking at the impact that it had on learners. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about our implementation trials and how that has kind of evolved. The next slide. Um, this slide for me is really a marker to be sure I let you know that we've had some pretty big aha moments. Um, you know, I always say that UDL doesn't take that long to learn, but it takes a lifetime to master because you always have new contexts, new, you know, new goals, new resources, new players. Um, and so we've really started. Um, looking at UDL more intentionally through the eyes of those descriptors or characteristics of expert learners. And I must say at a state conference, a CAS cons uh, consultant, Neil Elbero, had our table, table groups from project people work on a task and then he unpacked it with us and we metacognated on it. And we had truly experienced ourselves um, being expert learners and in, in engaging and enacting some of those characteristics of expert learners. And we were, you know, we had already known the goal of UDL as expert learners, purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable, strategic and goal-directed, and you know, we got it. But um, he really helped us see that as a system, we are trying to become expert learning as a system. So as a state system, we talk about in continuous improvement, but continuous improvement is really continuous learning as a system. And teachers are in a profession that requires the continual gauging of their learning and their impact on that sweet spot of where the learner intersects with what they're providing and designing. So, um, you know, this, this book, Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice, you know, I read things now and then I, or I read it before, I read it now and it means different things because I've had different experiences. So definitely a seminal piece of um, writing that has helped our project. The implementation trials um, have evolved. Um, we had some, um, we of course have, have teacher teams working in the districts and they are intentional about serving, collaborating on the serving of students with and without IEPs, students with IEPs being getting their instruction in the general education curriculum and environment. So that's kind of the, the parameter of these trials. And um, we provided a more standardized tool for them to capture their data of their baseline and then their subsequent trials. And what they're capturing data on are two different facets. One is their own local context of their curriculum 
for a focus area that has some legacy to it, has some generalizability they can work on and want to build proficiency and sophistication and quality of learning over time. And we also ask them to take a look at four specific areas of observable behaviors of engagement that we draw, drew from um, two research papers on engagement. And so that means the educators have to design assessment tools with performance criteria, proficiency thresholds, understand how good is good enough and have some inner rater reliability. And what they do is then they kind of systematize their instruction progression so that they can offer novel tasks to those learners to demonstrate over time and then capture those trials data. And not only is the data impactful for how UDL is working, but it's also the process of working together and how they're talking about learning, learning and learners how they're talking about their own craft, how they're opening up their own vulnerability of what they need to know in that just in time professional learning they get to get so that they can take the next iteration of this process. It's really exciting to be a part of. This is the evidence we use. And when I say we use, we really try to apply it to um, different, different ways we mobilize the activities of the grant and support capacity for implementation. For LEAs, we're looking at their scaling. Are you scaling within teams across grade levels in schools district-wide? Um, how is learning growth being monitored in the trials? It's baseline to the end of trial cycle three, but they're capturing other local data um, as you know, indicators of, of UDL effectiveness. And then um, many, many um, impact anecdotes from grant participants about how it's changed their whole frame of mind, how um, they can't not see a barrier everywhere now, um, how eager they are to meet challenges and um, how much more they're focusing on learning and not teaching, like what they're gonna do. They're really looking at it from the perspective of what is the learner's experience. Um, so, you know, those are some beautiful triumphs for us. The CISAs, um, we've used a capacity assessment score for supporting implementation. And based on that baseline that we took last March, we crafted the, the um, activities for this year's grant. And um, much of the work that we've done as a, as a regional and statewide team came as a result of that capacity assessment. I'm kind of anxious on taking um, a follow-up scoring. Um, as I mentioned, that meant that we did develop some more professional learning resources and then CISAs also capture participation and usability ratings from participants that um, they engage with. Um, we've had some wins and we've had some things we've kind of fixed along the way and that just makes us learners and that a whole continuous learning process um, activated for us. Um, Win certainly is having CAST as a critical friend and thought partner, as well as expertise on training and coaching. Um, they bring just a wealth of experience on implementation and they help inform us what other states, what other schools are doing. And so we get to learn a lot more than just what CAST knows. We get to learn what CAST has experienced with other implementers. I'm very appreciative for the funding this project gets and um, being able to craft and carve out the deliverables for the funding based on implementation science and based on fidelity to UDL and um, working with in systems thinking and an equity framework and lens that our state of Wisconsin is um, very, being very intentional about having a learning focus. And again, um, we talk a lot about learning design and not lesson planning and make distinctions about what that means for us. And then um, systematizing more things in the trials. Some of the things we fixed is we're having the CISAs instead of just being lone rangers in their own regions, we're working with the CISAs as a statewide regional set of teams so that they can benefit from other CISA consultants. 
we've had overt intersections with other work. Our CISA people are part-time and they wear hats in their agencies around early childhood PSTs, um, early uh, special education, um, assistive technology, educator effectiveness, um, all kinds of different roles that they, they play. So they never take their UDL hat off. So there's been good ways to intersect UDL that way. Um, I have realized that UDL takes a lot of conversation, that it's a constructivist kind of thing. You can't just like learn it and know it. And um, we always like to do the coaching on the design on the front end instead of coaching people after they've learned something or done something and have them reflect. We wanna do the coaching on the, on the front end. And so we've been able to offer um, that kind of support. And as well as we had to ramp up the support for educators in the design of their assessments for their trials. So um, UDL in Wisconsin, um, our project seems to be a mechanism to operationalize educational equity from the practitioner's perspective. Um, any teacher can step into equity work right now, today, with UDL, and um, we view UDL also as a principled approach to educational justice. You know, we don't stop having principles at the um, design door, but we are looking for clear goals. We're looking for what are those barriers? What are our intentional and unintentional consequences for what we're designing? And how are we going to serve those who um, are most marginalized? so that all students, families, schools, and communities can thrive um, in Wisconsin, so. So well said, Jane, and I think what really has resonated for me is the word learning. I heard the word learning so often in there, learning and learners. And as you all have questions, please feel free to put them in the, in the chat box. And uh, if you have comments, please feel free um, to share those there. And I wanna get to our second story in New Hampshire. And again, please look for the similarities, the overlap and the pieces that are unique to these different state stories. Um, stories. Thank you, Jane. Mary Lane and Greg, welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Lane, and I work in the New Hampshire Department of Education, and I oversee um, accessibility. Uh, my responsibilities happen to be managing the New Hampshire UDL Innovation Network and the Center for Family Voice. And I also work with Greg. Greg, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Yeah, absolutely. I am Greg Amend. I, as you just heard, I work with Mary. I am New Hampshire's UDL scholar. Um, so I do research, UDL implementation, and some consultation with Mary on strategically planning upscaling of New Hampshire UDL. And I'm also a middle school English teacher in a rural New Hampshire school. Excellent. So this is about our why, right? You are seeing a picture with uh, Commissioner Edelblu at a school in New Hampshire, I believe, uh, this school is where he goes to look at how children are engaging. His passion is looking at personalized learning and every child have a personal journey. Commissioner Edelblu is a very good supporter of universal design for learning. He sees it as an evidence-based way that we can really provide looking at variability versus disability for our children. We're very dedicated to a definition of personalized learning in New Hampshire based on competency-based education. This has been the belief by which we've been able to look at some of the problems we were seeing on accessibility, moving towards a universal design to be able to address those issues. And so we started with eight small schools and we've now progressed to about 74 schools, including district-wide implementation. And we've done it by really listening to the voice of the schools and the families and making the adjustments along the way. And that's what Gray's gonna kind of walk us through as he personally has had this journey. So our journey really began in 2014, as I said. We had under uh, another commissioner of education, Virginia Berry, 
really a focus on personalized learning and support from the governor's office, who was then Maggie Hassan. This is where um, we had created an office of student wellness. And from that, we realized that our work was merging together. So the multi-tiered system of support out of a practice of um, protocol for wellness, along with engaging from the universal design for learning framework, we realized that we were just moving the mountain together. And from that, we started with our Universal Design for Learning Academy. I mentioned about the fact that most of our changes happened from the field, reflecting and, and giving us the uh, how, why things were working, what the roadblocks were. And we realized that we had to really look at across the Department of Education. I can remember Dr. David Rose saying that to me and looking at, we need to think of this as an ecosystem of innovation. We need to really focus on the personalized learning and the student wellness, but make sure it's encompassed because instead of feeling as though we're competing against other works or initiatives, we were really using UDL as the umbrella. But we felt that the barrier happened to be around leadership, leadership at the district level, leadership at the state level. And so from that was created the UDL Leadership Academy. And also that we had to think outside that box and thank heavens we did around multiple ways by which districts who have a system set up for professional development that would be flexible enough so that we would do the instructional rounds, we would be able to do some online training. And luckily for us, when we COVID hit, we were able to upscale and implement on a basis that really was reflective of universal design. How ironic could that be? And then we came to the magic moment of, oh, everyone's doing all this work. Where's the credit? Because it's not happening in the traditional professional development arenas. It's not happening so far in you, you, at higher ed, we're working on it. So the Commission of Education moved forward with credentialing and we had our first universal design for learning credential badge, as you might say, so that folks were actually getting credit and earning that credit in their work. And it's been very, very um, positive outcome for our teachers and families and leaders. Greg, want to look at? Uh, would you like to talk about because you actually are doing the work around our parallel leadership strategy, which really is looking at almost like a tiered system of support? Yeah. So as Mary had mentioned a little bit on the timeline, we were looking at leadership and how can we create a sustainable UDL culture in our state and in our schools. So we figured that if we had um, leadership opportunities that CAS help us implement through coaching sessions, through professional development opportunities, conferences, webinars, you know, the, the spectrum of really what CAS does. And we bring some of that to the state level and then also use the same approach locally in our schools with administrators, as well as teacher leaders, that we would have all pieces of our educational system working together to shift mindsets a little bit and build a inclusive UDL culture that was able to be flexible with the different projects that the state has going on, as well as that idea of personalized learning. Um, and so at the state level, we looked at having opportunities of conversations with colleagues across bureaus, um, meetings, learning seminars that really per were personalized to each department specifically, as well as the stakeholders that were involved. And we really want to connect the bureaus there. And then we did the same thing at the local level, um, working with CAS, having them come out for fall, spring seminars, or having them visit schools. They were always able to provide not only options, you know, modeling UDL, which is, a, is extremely important, not just for CAS, but for local and state leadership. Um, they were able to personalize the experience and professional development models that um, were rel that made UDL relevant to any teacher, no matter the teacher's skill level, their pedagogical philosophy, or what they knew about UDL. And that was really important to us. Um, and then also at the local level, um, New Hampshire made a, a drastic push for collaboration at our conferences, as well as in the buildings. And you can see that also reflected in the state leadership. And I want to really mean, give you the message of go with your feeling, go with your gut, because what, and many of the things that we heard from the field, but then we actually said, why don't we do it this way, really worked because everybody's voice was part of that decision. Greg, you want to talk a little bit about the meaningful learning and what do we mean by the edu excellent educators and the personal sure. experience? 
Yeah, so at the beginning, we were very, as you heard me mention, we were interested in establishing a sustainable culture, a sustainable attitude around UDL. And so early on, we strategically had a lot of conversations around how do we upscale in New Hampshire? How do we go from eight schools, as you heard Mary say, to 74, 70 and change, as she mentioned? Um, we had a lot of conversation of how at the same time can you propel learning and student engagement in the classrooms, as well as teacher engagement. Um, and so early on, we focus on the idea of excellent educators. And we took the same UDL principles that you see in the frameworks that get students engaged and brought those to the teachers in our UDL um, professional development models from how they learn to how they implement. And then of course, you know, what, one thing I didn't mention in the last slide was ongoing supports mm -hmm. in the classroom, um, having opportunities to regularly talk to coaches, um, constant round table discussions open that CAS helps us do. Um, on Fridays often. And we took every moment that we could, everything that was going on. So what you see in the bottom of the slide is actually an engagement in evening where we looked at the wellness work around Choose Love and engaging families in Manchester, one of our largest districts, using not only the family engagement component, but also universal design. And it worked, it got folks out and engaged. Yeah, so what you hear Mary talking about right now is the complementary supports. So, you know, along with us looking at the leadership and the mindset of education in our state, we want to take the UDL framework and try to apply it in many areas, as many areas of education as we could. Um, mm -hmm. Connecting, of course, obviously with, with AT and AME, with student wellness, with our authentic family, work, uh, authentic family voice program. Um, because when you look at the framework, I, I thought Jane had said, what isn't it, right? Like you can think about UDL and really what isn't it? And it was easy for Mary and myself to identify that UDL and the framework can be applied to engage professionals across all sectors of education in our state. And how can we look to do that? And we experienced that and we experiment with that um, in different areas in New Hampshire. Um, and then we also do that same sort of experiment. We use that same sort of philosophy in our classroom. Um, which is where that personalized learning, that personalized experience bullet point comes from. or well, providing teachers with the research, the research or resources needed for them to experiment with UDL, providing flexible options in the classroom and choices, making use of the technology that they're interested in that they wanna participate with. And you kind of see that in that top picture, you see a gamut of technology on that table, as well as a flexible seating in the classroom environment for I think in the background, the top left is a standing desk, um, adjustable medical stools, adjustable stairs, and that's just some of the furniture in that classroom that you see there. Um, so we also, you know, not only looked at classroom design, but then we took it further and we looked at our state's ecosystem. And we mm -hmm. talked about masters, mastery, competencies, pathways, variable environments, where do students learn? We have um, a push in our state for students to learn everywhere. And so what does that look like if we wanna take the UDL framework and apply it to um, job shadowing or uh, students taking internships or mentorships, uh, workplace study, those sort of things. Um, so we're constantly looking at, the, looking at and using the UDL framework to apply and uh, address variability in different areas in our state's education system. And we're not done. We're looking at early learning. We're looking at across from birth to workforce. How do we look at accessibility and universal design is the way to go. So we want to just, you know, address the mindset barrier and really drive this idea home. Um, for us, for New Hampshire, we felt that it was the right approach because you, you guys heard the numbers um, in the, the digital uh, material handout link. There is our report. Um, New Hampshire's 2020 UDL report where you can see how UDL has grown in our state. And I do feel and Mary feels the same way that a lot of that came because early on we said, how do we have, how do we create a mindset that's going to support UDL? Um, and very early on in our, our process of trying to upscale UDL, while we were also learning about what it was, um, we had this idea back in 2016 and about how UDL implementation requires, you know, all leaders, all stakeholders to recognize and use, you know, their abilities or their influences to address inequalities and the barriers that we see in our schools. 
Um, and that ranges, you know, the gamut of our educational system for us and our upscaling efforts. And we weren't afraid to really rely on our partners. So social, uh, the Bureau of Student Wellness, um, the Bureau of Literacy, they are um, our colleagues. They help us, but they really have to make sure that they're understanding that our job is to meet all children's needs and to look at variability, not disability. Amazing. And I'm hearing common threads like mindset, engagement, listening to each other, UDL as an umbrella, collaboration, mm -hmm. intentional design, and continued learning for all. And so um, I'm again, just, I'm jotting down my notes. I hope you all are jotting down your notes and feel free to continue to share them, your ideas, your questions. And we'll shift now. Thank you so much, Mary Lane and Greg. And I want to shift to a state called Delaware and welcome our team from Delaware. Kick it off, Amy or Megan. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, uh, I'm going to kick it off. Um, so we are from the Access Project of Delaware. So we're housed at the University of Delaware, um, but we're contracted with the um, Department of Education from Delaware. Um, and so they gave us the task of learning what UDL was all about. And so it's nice that we get to go last as, a, um, as the third state because what we did was we reached out to both Wisconsin and New Hampshire to sort of find out what UDL looks like in action. So we contacted um, Shannon Schultz from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And we said, can we come and hang out with you for a couple of days and see what, um, what it looks like when you go in and observe some teachers. And so she graciously let us come um, and hang out with her. And she gave us lots of um, data sheets that we could use. And we got to see her observe some teachers and some UDL in action and some planning session with teachers doing uh, planning with UDL in mind. And then um, we got to talk to Greg and see what he thinks about when he's planning for his lessons and what he, what he take, what he thinks about with UDL in mind um, and doing some planning, which was really helpful for us because um, we had a middle school come knocking very soon after we were charged with this. Um, and so I'm gonna let Amy take over. Yeah. So, you know, as Megan said, this is the way this um, panel has been, um, and I, I don't think it was intentional at first, um, but the way it's working out is really like a timeline. Um, so we are still in the beginning phases, um, still working on, you know, a couple different schools, um, but working with our Department of Ed to kind of spread, you know, the, the, the joy of UDL. Um, so our first implementation here in Delaware began in a school that um, consisted of seventh and eighth grade students. And we delivered our proposed plan to the principal. Um, we stress the importance of eliciting uh, volunteers for this work and you know they that these teachers would be working with us for about 10 weeks on a coaching cycle meeting with us weekly um, and that that cycle itself consisted of week in, weekly lesson and I'm going to spin off of Jane a little bit and say designing I want to get in the habit of saying designing um, so weekly lesson designing um, lesson visits that we um, and then uh, coaching thereafter kind of debriefing and we also modeled for the teachers. We co-taught with the teachers um, and we help them transfer, for, transform their rooms into a more flexible spaces as Greg had um, alluded to earlier. We offered resources and strategically helped them uh, or strategically aligned any kind of professional development um, to the needs of the teachers. So that year, it was that one seventh grade ELA team um, they were the only grade level specific content area that increased their performance on the Smarter Balance Assessment, which is what we take here in Delaware. From that time on, you know, before that, the principal was like, yeah, they're in here, UD's in here, they're doing their work. We were called UD, we were called UDL, you know, depending on, on you know, what the day of the week, I guess. Um, but it wasn't until those Smarter Balance Assessments came back and she said, wow. Um, you know, so from that point on, she was, you know, although she was initially disengaged with UDL, she became very, very interested um, and asked us to then expand into all of the ELA classes in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade um, 
you know, classrooms. So that year, interesting enough, um, two of the grades fully, you know, uh, used the UDL framework to design their lessons. Um, they were fully engaged with us. Um, we had great relationships with them. And, you know, um, there was one grade level that was merely just kind of going through the motions. They were doing it because they were told to do it. Um, and what we learned that year is that the two that were quote unquote bought in, again, raised their scores um, in Smarter Balance. The one that did not remain stagnant and they had been stagnant for, for several years before that. Um, year two also brought um, a halftime UDL coach. Um, one of the U, uh, one of the ELA teachers that we did coach. Eventually, we kind of brought her on. So thinking about capacity the entire time we're doing this, um, as well as a Department of Ed um, math coach, um, you know, um, who participated in the coaching cycles right along with us. He was there to integrate a brand new curriculum or implement a brand new curriculum. We aligned it with UDL and, and we, we made a great team actually. Um, and again, you know, that great, that year, uh, there was one grade level that, that did not really want to have anything to do with UDL. Um, one teacher, I, there was a substitute teacher, couple couple different substitute teachers that year. And then one kind of just kind of pushed us by the, by the wayside. Um, and as you would have it, the two that used UDL to design their lessons um, also increased their scores. So year three and four, we expanded into science and social studies um, and related arts. Um, and the instructional coach, the math instructional coach, as well as the, um, the UDL coach, as they called it, um, you know, they kind of took over um, capacity building. And over the years, what has resulted is, a, is an amazing walkthrough tool that they de designed um, and it's being used by the administrators. Um, UDL has talked about in every PLC, in every staff meeting, everything they, they do. Um, and, you know, they've integrated other initiatives, PBIS, um, they're a big AVID school, so that, you know, those align well with UDL, um, as, as well as um, culturally responsive teaching. Um, so they have what started out is that that those three teachers expanded into um, really a transformation, I believe, of the school. So, you know, Delaware is such a small state. Some of you may not have ever even heard of Delaware. We get that Delaware all the time. Um, and but when others here uh, have started to hear of the implementation in the state, um, other schools began to reach out to us. Um, so we're now coaching in about five schools, um, each with its own different take on implementation um, and they're all based on the needs of the schools and you know how it operates and and so forth um, we're also you know we're still collaborating with the delaware department of ed to provide professional developments to increase awareness of udl that's a big thing right now is that that whole awareness and exploration in delaware um, most notably we have a k-4 literacy cohort um, where participants uh, work with me and two other members of our of our team um, to learn about UDL and to complete a, a lesson plan. And then they go on to earn the level two credential um, through learning design, which is supported by CAS. Um, we also have developed micro credentials similar to New Hampshire um, that, you know, that we're continuously working on. Working on um, and <clears throat> When you, we think when we when we kind of go back and look at you know the the five years or so that we've been you know working with UDL, um, we've had a lot of barriers. Um, first first and foremost, I think in in several of the schools we've been in is is that that area of trust. Um, you know, it, it's it's um, right from the beginning. You know, um, we're strangers and we're coming into their classroom, and you know, there's there's a certain amount of vulnerability there. And we're watching them teach and we're, you know, we're coaching them. And in several of these schools, teachers are used to people coming in saying they're going to fix it and then leaving. And that's kind of what they expected of us at first. Um, you know, any kind of new initiatives, it's brought in, it's, it's quickly abandoned and, and so forth. Um, so we've had to listen and have really hard conversations, you know, with them. Um, we let them express their feelings share why, you know, they don't think this is going to work now. And then, you know, we have 
you know, we have some great comebacks. I shouldn't say comebacks, but we are, we are, we are great at um, getting to the goal of UDL, you know, and that, that whole idea of equity um, and, you know, for all and each student. Um, so, you know, having those conversations, letting them know we're working beside them is truly important. Um, we do try to take that extra step. You know, we acknowledge birthdays. We, um, you know, we have celebrations. If it's teacher of the year, you know, we celebrate with them. Um, you know, we, we were also very strategic about our coaching, making sure that, you know, when we first go in, we're really concentrating on those glows of the lesson, you know, all the things, oh yeah, look, you did this. Let me show you how it aligns to UDL. You know, I know you were, you were intentional about why you did, you know, what you were doing. So let me show you, let me give you some language that kind of goes with that. Um, we, you know, the data, we stress that it, it's between us, you know, the coaches and, and the teacher, and it doesn't go to administration, um, you know, that we're really, and, and we have been asked by administration, can I, and we're, you know, we'll say, no, we'll give you as a, as a group summary. Um, but, you know, we want the teachers to trust us with data. Um, we've modeled lessons and one particular one I modeled with the teacher. We thought we were, we had it. We thought the, the lesson was going to go great and it flopped. And the teacher kind of sat back and was like, hmm, I told you so. So I kind of turned it around and said, okay, tell me what I, what barriers I missed. And that was, you know, that kind of opened it up. She let me see that she saw me at my most vulnerable. Um, so that went a long way as far as, as, far as trust. Um, and one other really, you know, big one um, has been that teacher buy-in, but, but really with that administrator, um, making the, the administrator making UDL a priority. Uh, we found that, you know, without an administration that fully understands and, and can, um, you know, identify and internalize a goal for UDL, that it's never going to take hold. Um, we've had to have very hard conversations um, with administration, you know, telling them that you need to be present at faculty meetings, you need to be present at the UDL lead meetings. Um, if you're not this, you know, it's not going to work. We're not going to build capacity. And when we leave, UDL is going to fall by the wayside. Um, so we've had, like I said, very hard conversations, but um, they've been fruitful. I will say that. <laughs> well, I have to say that um, coming from the Department of Ed, I am the, the, the Access Project's biggest cheerleader. We're so proud of the work that they have done. And we're really excited for where it's coming at the state level. Um, this year, we just rolled out our MTSS regs, um, new regs, um, and they went out of special education into the general education area. And what's really exciting is to see um, the involvement of the curriculum and development um, project at DOE, instead of it just living within special education that currently funds um, the access projects work, we now have additional contracts that are happening um, for the access project around targeted support, um, um, like Amy and Megan had mentioned. So we're really excited. Um, we believe that with um, UDL being included with MTSS, it was in all of our implementation guides, our district guides, our school-based guides. Um, UDL was um, embedded in that and um, being part of the conversation and now being at the leadership table um, in MTSS, we think that it's going to go broader and um, everyone's gonna want more of it. And we're really excited um, for the capacity that we'll be building as a state. Um, something to think about, um, you know, is the funding, like, how do we make this happen? Because we have this little amazing team at the University of Delaware doing the work and we have, you know, a small state, but, um, you know, there's a lot of people that want it and they've done a great job answering to the call during COVID and developing, you know, how to teach remotely using UDL and developing webinars to give access to everyone. Um, but we want to think and expand and we continue to do this the best that we can. And we're thankful to have a project to partner with that provides great instruction to support kids equitably. So. Actually, I'm going to piggyback off of that, Susan, if I can for a minute. There was a great question, just what is the annual cost of the various statewide implementation pilot projects? So I know that could be a tricky question, but I did want to see if any of our panelists wanted to, uh, wanted to just speak to that at all. You know, I, you know, for coming from 
uh, DOE, we have a contract with the University of Delaware that embeds a lot besides just UDL. So that's a hard question to answer because they do more than just UDL work for us. Um, they support a communication initiative, they support an IEP initiative. So it's a rather large um, sum, but to take care of the salaries of, Megan, how many staff do you have? We have five. Five staff and a project manager um, to do all this work. Um, so just thinking about what it might cost to support that. But um, we have three folks that are right now primarily working on UDL. Um, so, a, that's a hard question to answer directly mm -hmm. um, because we we look at the contract as a whole. Did it, uh, did it yeah, go ahead, Jane. I was just gonna say um, in Wisconsin, we have um, we have earmarked funding to pay for about twelve to twenty days for a CISA contact person for each of the CISAs, so very part time. And can That's you remind I, everyone what the CISA is again? The Cooperative Educational Service Agencies is what we call our intermediate agencies. Um, so they get some funding, but like I said, they try to maximize the benefit of UDL by, by you know, putting it in the other hats that they wear for a full-time contract in their agencies. Each of the nine school districts gets $10,000 a year. And then we have some money for, um, some coaching support and a contract with PAST. So um, it's not a lot of money, but we try, like I said, we try to um, embed and integrate UDL wherever we can. And Mary Lane from New Hampshire, I just wanted to say the question, um, I agree with Susan because if, uh, I, the dollar amount is really shared across bureaus. We also are looking at our own state UDL educator. And so it's it's kind of a moving target, but um, it's worth whatever penny. If you wanted to call and ask of how we came to these decisions, that might be a better way to help people understand what supports you need to do this work. And that's a great segue into we really one of the goals of having this conversation is to build the conversation. We really hope that you reach out to us. Please explore those resources that are in the digital handout. Please reach out to these folks in the digital handout. They've included contact information to get in touch. And as you heard from a number of them, it was from calling someone up and saying, can I come check it out? Can I have, you know, have a conversation that uh, new ideas were sparked? And, and again, I continue to write down ideas ideas that I thought were overlapping, you know, this UDL as an umbrella, working together, the collaboration around the design, the variability. I heard the word equity a lot. I heard modeling a lot. So really thinking about how UDL can permeate. And I go back to Jane, that image of the drum. UDL is just the bass drum that you just continue to play. And everything, you know, the rhythms and everything can come around it, but you have this bass drum of UDL in the background. And I did want to point out something that's really exciting um, for you all to make sure if you don't know about this. Many of you hopefully do, but if you don't, there are exciting opportunities to grow your UDL work with the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. So funding is now available and most of it goes to districts. So if you want UDL scaled, here's your chance, you know, here it is. Um, you can use your ARP funds to invest in your staff, in UDL, reach out to those districts, partner with them, partner with CAS through those ARP, through the ARP Act to really support all of your learners. Think of all of your learners and think of, you know, ways that the UDL framework can really support all learners to be able to access and become the expert learners that we've heard about in this. So there's a bit.ly uh, link here for you to be able to reach out to us, contact us and learn more. So hopefully that will be helpful for you all. Of course, there are some other really exciting ways to network, even with COVID. So we have the 2021 UDL IRN Summit, and then the seventh annual CAST UDL Symposium. So these are coming up. You know, we would love to have you join remotely. The summit is April 13th and 14th, which is soon. Pre-conferences are Monday, April 12th. So, you know, connect with other state leaders, connect with other uh, districts here. And the CAST UDL Symposium is July 20th to 30th. Both are online. And 
If that's not your thing, we have an amazing book. This is called Your UDL Journey, A Systems Approach to Transforming Instruction. It's by Dr. Patty Ralibate and Elizabeth Burquist. You can save 20% uh, during checkout with the code CASTPL until April 9th. But it's really, I think it's one that can align with these stories that you heard today. Both of these educators are from Maryland and Virginia. So again, I know that this work is happening across the United States. And we have some international folks thinking about how it's applying and the international stories that you may want to share. So stay tuned for that conversation as well. And we're hearing from some folks, you know, I love this book. It is, it's a fabulous book. So that could be a next step. And we also have a newsletter. CAST has a lot of research and development that goes on, amazing design, um, design work that happens, professional learning opportunities. So if you want to stay in touch, please do sign up for the CAST newsletter. But mostly, we, I would love to extend a thank you to our panelists. Um, they're just, the stories, there, there was a comment here, it was, it was reassuring to hear that this takes time. You don't just say, you know what, I'm gonna go have a, a two day UDL workshop and everyone's just gonna you know, check off the box and we're gonna implement universal design for learning. So I wanna thank you for sharing with us, thinking about um, the way that you're collecting data, the way that you're providing time for your educators to work, to collaborate, to model, to connect with each other, to listen to their students and to families. I mean, you're really integrating across ages, across disciplines. It's really phenomenal to hear the word engagement was in there. So I want to thank you for continuing to think about engagement and mindsets. So I want to see if, if any of you have a last word that you would like to share as we close out here. Just don't give up. Just, you know, if you believe in UDL, um, you know, just keep, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Play that bass, uh, bass drum. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> don't, don't shy away from this question. What is the goal? Fabulous. Because Fabulous. that is the basis with which all the options are generated on behalf of. And sitting next to somebody in design work, whether it's a workshop, a course, whatever it is, um, the goal is really important. What's the goal of your UDL implementation project? You know? so in Mary Lane from New Hampshire, don't be afraid to use the UDL guidelines in all of your work, including collaborating with your community and your families. I'll conclude with if if you want teachers to buy in, then leadership has to model UDL throughout the whole process. That's super important. Well, I'm so honored to have gotten to speak with you all today. Uh, please do a take our survey. Let us know what you like, what you would like more of. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and to continuing this networking and conversation to really make sure that learning has no limits for all individuals, every single individual. So thank you all so much for being here today. Take care. <laughs>